Um, I am the physical therapist at NovaCare Rehabilitation on Perry Highway. Um, it's called our Wexford office, but it's really more of the North Hills. Um, so for reference from the library, um, if you head south on Perry Highway, come past the new sheets, um, we're just on the right sharing a parking lot with Edzema Pharmacy um, to give you a couple of landmarks there. So we're not far from the library at all. Um, I am new to this clinic. I used to float in the whole greater Pittsburgh area. Um, so I used to go to a lot of different NovaCare clinics, um, but I came up to this clinic full time in May of last year. Um, so when does that make that? Eight, no, seven months or so, seven, eight months I've been here at this location. And um, I've really been enjoying you know, being here. Um, I do live locally. Um, so I live in Franklin Park. Um, and I have a son who is a year and a half old. So um, he keeps life very entertaining and, and fun. Um, did anybody have any questions for me, like from the clinic side of things or personal side before um, we get started with the snow shoveling as we wait for, you know, just a couple people to, to log on here. All right, if we don't have any questions, Katie, you just let me know when um, you want me to go ahead and start heading into the, the snow shoveling topics and then we'll- Yeah, I think, I think we are good to go ahead and get started. Oh, we do have a question in the chat. Um, we have, what is a muscle spasm? I have heard that term, but I've never been able to figure out what it means. Do you feel your muscle shake? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, a lot of times, and I see this a lot with doctors as well, they spend a very short amount of time with you um, during their evaluation, and then they say all these things, and then they send you on your way, right? Um, and so a lot of times what we hear, especially with the lower back, is there's muscle spasm there, right? So a muscle spasm um, is when we have an involuntary contraction in the muscle, all right, so usually when a muscle is in spasm, if our muscle length is usually this long, that spasm length then becomes this long. So it's another way to say muscle guarding as well um, can be a way that we can talk about that too. Muscle guarding usually happens on a global sense. There's usually multiple muscles involved when it comes to muscle guarding and, try, and to try to stabilize a specific area. Um, muscle spasms, on the other hand, usually refer to more individual muscles when we're talking about that. Um, but it's just that involuntary tightness that won't let up. Um, when you say, you know, do you feel your muscle shake? A lot of times if we're trying to do a task and a muscle is shaking, that can be several different things. It can be pain, it can be tightness. Um, it can also be weakness if we're trying to do something that's really, really difficult and we get that shaking kind of feeling um, just from muscle weakness. So shaking doesn't necessarily um, indicate that there is a spasm there, but because of you know, associated pain and weakness, it can go alongside spasm. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, hopefully so. I think that was a very good answer, thorough. <laughs> yes, okay, okay. perfect. Go. Thank you. Um, but yeah, if we wanna jump right into to some snow shoveling fun, I know we all, have needed it the past week and will need it yes. to come. <laughs> yes, so um, when it comes to shoveling snow, we want to be um, very aware of a few different things. First is safety when it comes to fall risk because of those wintry weather conditions, we want to be extra aware of that, even if we are you know, not an individual who would be considered a high fall risk in a typical situation. We basically all become a fall risk as we're shoveling snow because it's a slippery surface to be walking on. Um, so one of the things that you really wanna make sure that you're doing 
is making sure that you have a good set of shoes on and just being aware of your surroundings as you're going about and shoveling the snow, trying to move in a slow controlled manner rather than rushing and going really quickly. Um, but good treaded shoes are the number one thing you wanna make sure that you've got when you're shoveling snow. Please don't try to do it in your slippers um, and you don't want your toes to freeze too. So there's always that. Um, but as, as long as you know, we're addressing that um, safety side from the falling first with a good set of shoes. If it's really, really bad, like freezing rain and it's a solid sheet of ice, you can also do, um, you know, in addition to salt, if you have like kitty litter, that can be really helpful to make it safer for you to go out there and try to clear the snow away. Um, when we're actually clearing the snow, the biggest thing that we want to look at is how do we protect our back and our shoulders? Um, so when we're shoveling snow, it's a very repetitive task. So even though one shovel full of snow is not going to be, you know, for most of us, our maximal lifting capacity, we want to make sure that we're approaching the mechanics of it as if we're lifting a really, really heavy object, because we're then going to repeat that multiple times. And that cumulative effect is a lot of times how we get those injuries from shoveling snow and we get into those muscle spasms in our back because we've really overworked them. Um, so the number one thing that we want to do is make sure that we are not lifting something that's too heavy for us. So I know that whenever we had that last big snowstorm, I went out shoveling snow and that was a really heavy snow, right? And we had ballpark eight, nine inches or so. Um, and so just getting one big shovel full of snow was very, very heavy. So making sure that we manage how much snow we're putting on that shovel because it's gonna be repetitive in nature. So it should feel more like a moderate type of weight for you, light to moderate because you're gonna be repeating that. If you're lifting that shovel and it feels heavy, then lessen the amount of snow on there. You're gonna be better off repeating multiple times than lifting something super heavy. Okay. Um, another thing that we really want to do is make sure that we're keeping things close to our body. So I'm going to move my computer here so that I can give you guys a visual. Give me a second here. Okay. So when we go to shovel snow, you have, I have my imaginary shovel here, right? When we are shoveling that snow, we don't want to be moving it very far away from us. So if you think of trying to lift something that's, you know, super, super heavy. We always are gonna do that close to our bodies because that's where we're strongest. If I have something really heavy and it's all the way out here, that's gonna put a lot of strain on my back. So the number one thing we wanna do, keep it close, okay? We also wanna make sure that we're stabilizing the lower back. So rather than, you know, bending over and having an arched back, or a forward curved back, try to find the happy medium, right? Where you can kind of flatten that lower back out and then bring that core in to tighten. One of the things that I frequently tell my patients to activate the core is to bring the belt buckle towards your belly button, right? So if you're wearing pants that had a belt, I obviously am not today, but if I had a belt on, I wanna bring my belt buckle towards my belly button or bring my belt buckle towards my ribs in order to flatten out my lower back, okay? In that position, we can better activate our core. The other really easy way to help bring your core on board as you're shoveling is to make sure that we're breathing. Breathing is a really important tool as we are shoveling snow. So we wanna make sure that we get in that neutral position and then exhale as we do the lifting portion of the snow, okay? So if that helps for you to do like that pursed lip where you're like blowing out a candle, then do so. The number one thing as far as breathing that we wanna avoid is holding your breath. If we hold our breath as we do things, it puts a lot of pressure on the core. It really increases our intra-abdominal pressure and then our core can't stabilize our lower back very well. Um, and this is also, again, like I said, something we're going to be doing multiple times as you clear the sidewalk or the driveway. So we want to make sure we're optimizing the mechanics as much as we can to protect you for all that repetitive motion you're going to do. Okay, so 
Once we get that lower back flat, we go to scoop, breathe out. I hope everybody can see there also how I'm bending from the knees. What we don't wanna do is scoop like this, right? So you can't see too many, too much of my knees. I'm gonna alter that there a little bit. So as we are going to scoop the snow, we wanna do as much as we can with the knees so that my lower back again stays flat rather than bending from the lower back. Um, that's gonna be really helpful in decreasing stress to your lower back. Just like we say to bend from the knees if you're lifting a box. Um, and then the last couple of things that I always tell people to focus on when we're throwing, when we're shoveling snow um, is sometimes you have no choice, but we wanna avoid that throwing motion of the snow as much as we can. So not reaching out too far like this. Um, if you have the availability to just push the snow instead of picking up the shovel, that's gonna be much easier on your back. Um, keeping a slight bend in the knees and still getting that more neutral position through the spine, as well as breathing out with effort, trying not to hold our breath as we do something difficult is still going to apply if you're pushing rather than shoveling up. Um, but the other number one thing that we see with shoveling snow that can cause pain is rotating. So you always wanna make sure that you're taking the snow in the same direction that your toes are going. So your toes and your nose should point to where you put the snow. We don't want to be standing this direction and then throw the snow over our shoulder. We wanna avoid that rotation when we're under you know, that lifting load. Um, other than that, other people, some people find it really helpful to have the shovels that have the ergonomic curve to them. Um, those can take a lot of pressure off. If you know you have a history of back pain and shoveling the snow always tends to irritate your back, even though you're trying to optimize your mechanics as best you can in those other ways, maybe that ergonomic curved shovel would be helpful for you. Um, but those are the number one things that we, we want to address when it comes to to sh snow shoveling. Very similar um, to what we wanna think about if we're doing lifting inside the home, um, lifting of our groceries and, and um, those types of things. So breathing out with effort, try not to rotate. You wanna take the snow in the same direction that your toes are pointing, right? Your toes and nose go with the snow um, and keeping those loads nice and close to you and bending from the knees. Um, those were the main things that I had as far as how to address the mechanics there with that. Okay, we, we have a question come up in the chat. Um, I see people at hardware stores that have a big belt around their waist. Um, would this be a good thing to wear when shoveling snow? So um, it can be a little bit hard to tell just off of that description, but what I'm assuming that is, is some type of a lumbar support belt. Um, usually they're kind of wide, they go the whole way around. Sometimes they're just compression. Sometimes there is plastic supports in the back um, to help stabilize the back. So what those are doing is providing some external support that we usually get from our core muscles. So when we talk about our core, we actually have deep core muscles called our transverse abdominis that look very similar to that belt, actually. That belt is a really good external representation of what our internal musculature looks like. Now, over top of this transverse abdominis muscle, we've got our obliques and we've got the six pack muscle, that rectus abdominis um, as well, contributing to those layers of the abdominal wall. But that transverse abdominus is the muscle that does the most work as far as stabilizing our trunk and stabilizing our lower back. So that belt is mimicking that muscle's function in that way. Um, when it comes to bracing, it, which is how, what I would consider that, like a back brace, right? When it comes to bracing, what we usually tell people is we don't wanna see it used all the time because I don't want to untrain those natural stability systems that your body already has. However, if there is a history of back pain or back issues and 
during those really difficult tasks. Snow shoveling is a very arduous task for, um, for you know for us to do, and it's not something that we're doing all the time. You know, so for some people, maybe they're okay with lifting day to day and the groceries out of the car and other things around the house, but that snow shoveling is just really really difficult, and it tends to flare things up. If the brace is helpful, then use it for that but I would not keep it on all day long. It's not something that I want to see my patients wearing all the time, unless there's, you know, severe consideration, like severe scoliosis, and they really need some of that support. But even in those cases, it's rare that um, patients will wear those, um, you know, 24 um, seven. But definitely something that can be used as a tool if needed, just like a knee brace, um, you know, something that we want to use only in those situations where we really, really need it um, rather than all the time because we don't wanna facilitate dependence on that or facilitate weakness where we should be training the stabilizing muscles instead. Did anybody else have any other questions? You know, it's not a mechanical related consideration when it comes to shoveling snow. Um, but taking breaks is also really important, especially if you have a big area to shovel. Um, we don't think about just brute strength when it comes to shoveling snow because it is such a repetitive task. You're getting a cardiovascular workout in with that as well. Um, and even for you know people who are maintaining their activity levels with their cardiovascular fitness in some way, be it walking or biking, um, when you combine the lifting with the repetitive nature of snow shoveling, that's a really hard cardiovascular workout too. Um, so a way that you can gauge your difficulty level as far as how much you are working your cardiovascular system as you're shoveling snow is to think about how easily could I have a conversation right now. Um, so as you're working and shoveling that snow, we want to maintain a kind of middle ground. I don't want you working so hard that you're unable to get a full sentence out. If you, if someone was next to you having a conversation, you should still be able to do that work and get out maybe two sentences at a time without feeling like you're really breathing heavy, right? Um, so if you're shoveling and your neighbor comes up to say hello and you're like, hi, Bill, how are you? Then we probably need to take a break and let, um, let the cardiovascular system recover a little bit and then maintain a working pace where you can say a sentence or two at a time rather than only being able to get a couple words out at a time before you have to catch your breath as you're working. Um, if anyone else has, has other questions, you can feel free to hit the unmute um, and ask them over the audio if you would like or type them into the chat bar if you have have some other questions. I actually have a question. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, um, <laughs> is there anything different you should do on hills, like especially like, you know, hilly sidewalk or if your drive is um, a hill? Because um, I know that's a big thing for many of us around that's here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I really want you to be careful of on those hilly situations is your grip, um, with the tread, especially if your driveway gets to be really steep. Um, so this is a situation where as much as you can, if you can use more of a pushing motion rather than a scoop and throw, um, that's going to be advantageous and also, you know, helping make sure you have more of a sure footing with that. Um, if the terrain allows you to, doing that pushing on a downhill is going to be a little bit easier than trying to push uphill. Um, so we want to make sure that, um, you know, we're approaching that hill in a safe way. Um, and hopefully for most of us, if we do have a hill on our driveway or our sidewalk, we can kind of go at it from from either direction and not really be forced into one direction over the over the other there. Um, but using that pushing motion as much as you can, when we get the really heavy snow, that's still real difficult. Um, and so if you have to do 
you know, a little bit more of the scoop and throw, scoop and throw. Um, I would be really watching your footing. One thing that can help with footing, especially on hills, is taking a really wide stance. So if you, um, see if I can get you to see me a little bit better, maybe. Okay. So if I'm standing and my feet are close together, if a really strong gust of wind came by, I'm going to move around a little bit more, right? This, what we call a narrow base of support with our feet close together. I know you can't see my feet, but they're pretty close together right now, right? So with our feet closer together, we call that a narrow base of support. We're going to be inherently less stable than if I was to take a really wide stance. What this does with a wide stance is it gives me a larger range for my center of gravity to fall into that I'm not going to fall over. So if I'm here and my center of gravity shifts, if my center of gravity shifts outside of that small base of support, I'm going to fall, right? But now I can do a lot more shifting and be much more stable. And so when we're looking at those hilly surfaces, we want to make sure that we're approaching it with that wide base and then using our knees to, to lift and shovel there. Um, I usually find it easiest on a hilly surface to have one leg low and one leg high rather than like looking straight down the hill if I have to do some of that, you know, toss and or scoop and toss. Um, Katie, was that helpful? Yes. <laughs> okay. I saw another question come in the chat bar. Um, I'm okay with the um, shoveling snow until the plow comes and leaves a large pile of snow at the bottom of the driveway. So how do we approach a large pile of snow that that um, plow leaves? This snow can be really problematic because when that plow moves it off, it's usually been salted too. And so things are melting and it gets really dense and really heavy. So this is a situation where even though your shovel can hold a lot more, you're gonna wanna take really small scoops to help with that because of that repetitive task. We don't want to repetitively lift something that is at, you know, what we would call, you know, maybe 80 or 90% of our maximal lifting capacity. We want to back that off to something smaller that's maybe 20 to 30% of our maximal lifting capacity, right? So with a single scoop, that should still feel light, maybe moderate, depending on how much you've got to do right? I don't want a single scoop of snow to feel really heavy for you. So that's the number one thing when it comes to moving a great big pile like that. The other really important thing when it comes to moving that snow that's just been accumulated in that one spot that really needs moved, that's where we can get into a lot of those habits where we, we scoop, turn, and throw. Scoop, turn, and throw. And that's what we really want to avoid is that turning and throwing. So as you're scooping, holding that shovel close, and then walking to where you're going to place that snow. Um, so, you know, scoop, and then walking, turning with my feet, and putting that snow in the other pile, you know, whether that, you know, right on this, on the side of the driveway instead. Um, but holding that snow and walking a few steps is going to be much more protective for your back than keeping your feet planted, scooping, and turning. Um, I think that is was Kathy that posted that question. Kathy, does that help, or is there something more specific than I can that I can help with with that question? That's an awesome answer. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, if anybody else has questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask them that way, or type them into the chat bar. Um, I'm, I'm also open to answering any um, off topic questions that you have. Um, but that was the content that I wanted to cover with you guys today. Um, hopefully we won't need it too many more times this winter. I don't know about you, but I think we've seen enough snow for one winter. I'm usually a one snow and done. I like to look at it. I like to see it through the window. I'll take my son out to play in it once or twice, and then I'm ready for springtime. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not really a fan of winter very much. So um, I think we're probably set to get a little bit more this, this year. So I apologize that I wasn't able to get all this information out to you guys before that great big snow, but 
Can't control timing with the weather, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay, so we had another question come into the chat. How long at one time should I shovel snow? Um, it, it always annoys me when there's leftover snow. So when you don't just get it all done right at once, right? And this is gonna be really dependent on each person. Um, so how long is too long for, for one person could be entirely different from how long is too long for another person. Um, so I know for to use myself as an example, when we got that great big snow a couple weeks ago with that eight or nine inches, um, I went out and I shoveled snow for about an hour and a half. Um, and I try to stay pretty active. I do a lot of running. Um, what I don't do is I don't work out my upper body. And so by the end of an hour and a half, I was feeling like I'd had a really strong cardiovascular workout too, despite all the running that I do, but man, were my shoulders feeling it. Um, had I approached that in a, um, you know, smarter way, I should have taken breaks as I was out there doing it. So even if you're not going to go inside and take a break, it can be beneficial just to stand or sit and rest outside for a few minutes and then continue. Um, so if we're waiting to rest until we're already really fatigued, we've waited too long. We want to take those rest breaks preemptively um, and also monitoring. Like I said, that um, talk test can be a good gauge of how hard are you working cardiovascularly. Um, but just taking times, you know, if your talk test is OK, but you've been out there for a while and you're starting to feel a little bit fatigued, Try taking just a break for a couple of minutes before that hard fatigue sets in and then approach the rest of what you have left to do in smaller increments. Um, Holly, did that help a little bit? I know, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific, but that one really is very dependent on each person. Yes, thank you, it did. Um, because I know you said you, you run, but due to the weather, I haven't been walking. Mm -hmm. um, I just started walking again. So that's always a concern for me. Um, how do I break this up? I, I've got to get the car out of the driveway safely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That talk test is important, um, you know, and just spacing your, your breaks as well based off of how you're feeling. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anything else I can answer for anybody? One more question. Is there anything that we can do during like the late fall and early winter to help us um, like some isometrics or anything like that? Um, like some exercises to get us, well, you know, a little bit fitter, but, you know, it's towards shoveling snow, meaning fit for shoveling snow. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely one of those tasks that is very seasonally dependent, right? Unless you're doing gardening where you're shoveling gravel or something or shoveling a lot of dirt and like digging in that manner, you're not really practicing this type of activity for most of us during any other point in the year. Um, so things that I like to do um, as far as general strengthening that it would also be helpful when you're shoveling snow is making sure that we're working those legs to make sure that our legs are ready to help us with that snow shoveling. Because if we're doing the mechanics correctly, we're in what I call a mini squat position. I'm gonna move my computer a little bit here. Hopefully you guys can, I had to plug into the wall here. So excuse me as I unplug. I didn't wanna die in the middle of our, our conversation. Um, so hopefully this will be be helpful here. But if we're doing our mechanics correctly as we're shoveling snow, can everybody see the little bit of knee bend that I've got? When I'm working in the clinic with patients, I call that a mini squat, right? So working on some repetitive squat type activities can be really helpful. Um, it can also be helpful to try to get a little bit of resistance for most of us. And I know my shoulders were definitely feeling it when I was shoveling that snow, wasn't used to having that kind of weight, right? Um, so if you've been, you know, if you're able to do, you know, say some mini squats and you can also hold on to like your kitchen counter 
for balance with those um, if you feel a little bit unsteady. But if you feel good with those, try doing it with a gallon of water or a gallon of milk. That's about eight pounds. Um, and show, snow can get pretty heavy, but that's going to be a great starting point to keep you, you know, in a more uh, snow fit shape, if you want to call it that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, Thank you. that's helpful. Yeah. So we'll give it another minute or two, um, just in case anyone's typing. But also, uh, just let everyone know, I will send a follow up email. So that way, if you do think of questions after the fact, I can always forward those along to Lauren and get you a number, get you a number, get you an answer. <laughs> um, and with the follow up, I can also include her information um, in case you would prefer to reach out to her directly. Yeah, so in the um, handouts that um, I passed along to Katie. One of them is a, a copy of snuff, shoveling snow tips. Um, it's kind of a little bit of a lengthy handout for, um, for my taste, but um, we're only allowed to do so much as far as, uh, you know, branding and all of those specific rules. Um, but as far as my contact information, the other paper on there, um, I believe has my email on it. Um, it's a bio sheet, just a little bit about me and about our clinic here um, at the North Hills Wexford location. Um, so if my email's on there, feel free to shoot me an email if you have a question. Um, it can just be helpful if you say, hey, I participated in, you know, the, the talk through the library the other day and I had a follow up question. Um, so I'm always free if you want to contact us that way. Um, or our number here at the clinic is 412-366-5090. Um, if you have any questions, you can always call the clinic as well. Um, I, when I do these talks, I always like to give the little disclaimer for people that under most insurance plans, we are able to see patients without a prescription from their doctor for 30 days. If you have, you know, say you're out shoveling snow and you feel like you've tweaked something that's not bad enough that says I need to go to the doctor right now, but I'd like to try to, you know, try a little bit of therapy and see if we can kind of nip this in the butt sooner rather than waiting um, to get an appointment with your PCP and then getting a script for therapy to come. Um, usually with back pain, physical therapy is one of the first things that we'll try. Um, and so a lot of times the, it's called direct access to come to see me without a prescription from your doctor. Um, it can save a lot of time depending on how busy your doctor's office is if you would like to get in for, for therapy. Um, so that's always an option. The only insurances that we cannot do that with are pure Medicare plans. So um, if you have say like an Aetna Medicare, usually we are allowed to do that if you have only Medicare, that is um, a Medicare stipulation that we need as prescription from your doctor first. Um, but in those situations, if you've been to see your doctor within a year, um, usually most doctors are okay sending us a prescription for therapy without you having a visit at their office. So that can be an option too. Um, but if you're under like an employer insurance, uh, what we would call a commercial insurance, um, like through your job, as long as it's a PPO plan and not an HMO plan, we're almost always able to see you via direct access if you have any concerns and want me to check you out before, um, you know, you would pursue a, an appointment with, you know, your PCP or anything like that. So I just always like to tell people that that's an option because not too many people know about that. Um, if you have more specific questions about that, you can always call our office as well and we'd be happy to talk you through that. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. And You're thank welcome. you everyone for joining us. Um, I know this was very helpful for me because I'm the one usually shoveling the snow. <laughs> um, but uh, again, thank you everyone for coming. And if you think of questions after the fact, don't hesitate to reach out to me or Lauren and we'll be sure to get you an answer. Um, and if that is all, looks like that's all the questions in the chat. So I will um, say good night to everyone. <laughs> Yeah, thank you everybody for joining us today um, and taking a little bit of time out of your evening to 
to listen to our little presentation. I hope that you found it helpful. Um, and I hope that we can all get through the rest of this winter rather uneventfully and look forward to warm spring days ahead, hopefully. Tinker's Gotta get through mud season first. <laughs> 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 it's usually how things go in Pittsburgh. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lauren. You're welcome. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. You're welcome.